focus on encephalitis in this talk. And the reason to do that is uh, obviously we're here because of autoimmune encephalitis, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I think there's uh, quite a breadth uh, in terms of the audience, a lot of diversity here. So I'm going to try to bring us all up to speed, make sure that, that we're on the same page as we move forward to some of the talks uh, that will follow. So um, I will briefly be discussing some off-label use of immunosuppressive medications, but we'll leave much of that to the speakers that follow. All right, so here's the outline of the talk. We're gonna define encephalitis, or at least try to. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the epidemiology of encephalitis and the burden that it imposes upon people. Uh, we're then gonna talk about challenges in terms of diagnosis and management of autoimmune encephalitis. So, how do we define encephalitis? Let me see if this encephalitis is defined as inflammation of the substance or the parenchyma of the brain, uh, usually in association with neurologic signs or symptoms. Um, and the, the patterns of inflammation can be highly varied. Uh, so one may have diffuse inflammation throughout the brain. There may be focal inflammation in just one part of the brain, or there, be, there may be multiple areas of inflammation called multifocal involvement. The other aspect of, of the disease is that you may have other portions of the nervous system involved. So for example, if the meninges are inflamed in addition to the substance of the brain, we call that a meningoencephalitis. If the spinal cord is inflamed in addition to the brain, we call that an encephalomyelitis and so on. So how do we diagnose it? Well, you know, if we were to do a biopsy, get a piece of tissue from a patient with encephalitis, what we might see is uh, inflammation around blood vessels. You see all these small cells surrounding this blood vessel. Uh, you might see accumulations of uh, immune cells uh, called nodules here, microglial nodules. You may see neurons that, again, have lots of immune cells kind of attacking them. When we see this constellation on brain biopsy, we know we're dealing with encephalitis, with primary inflammation of the brain. But as you guys know, we, we typically don't sample brain tissue from patients to try to make the diagnosis, right? And so what we're left with is really developing clinical criteria to try to determine whether we think that a patient has encephalitis or not. And a few years ago, uh, a group of us from the International Encephalitis Consortium tried to do this. We tried to establish clinical criteria. Um, and we did this really with an infectious encephalitis bent, as you'll see. So what we required was that uh, individuals would need to have substantially altered mental status lasting at least 24 hours, right? This wasn't a transient phenomenon and that there would be additional criteria, fevers, seizures, new focal neurological findings on exam that suggested that a part of the brain was inflamed. White blood cell counts in the spinal fluid that were increased as a marker of inflammation, or neuroimaging or EEG abnormalities that were compatible with inflammation in the brain. And the more of these additional criteria you had, the more certain you were that the patient had encephalitis. What's been recognized over the last few years is that these criteria and many others that preceded this really don't suffice for autoimmune encephalitis. And that's because, I think as, if you're, as you've already started to hear, the presentations can be different, the time course can be different. And so in recognition of that, uh, Sesh Grouse, Joseph Dalmau, Martin Titular, and others put together uh, proposed clinical criteria for autoimmune encephalitis, and that's listed right over here. And uh, I'll just point you to some of the notable differences. So one is a subacute onset of changes in the way one is thinking or behaving. Uh, and, and that is opposed to kind of more acute changes that had been outlined previously. Uh, those changes could just involve short-term memory loss, as you might see in limbic encephalitis. You didn't have to have changes in level of consciousness or personality, for example. Psychiatric symptoms were explicitly noted here because, as we've recognized, many of these autoimmune encephalitis can present with prominent psychiatric symptoms. That's why a lot of us are here to learn about that. Um, in terms of the inflammatory components, what has been recognized is that you don't always see increased white blood cells in the spinal fluid in patients with autoimmune encephalitis. And therefore, additional criteria were proposed that might suggest inflammation. 
And then some specific brain MRI findings were, were noted, uh, most notably uh, abnormalities in the medial temporal lobes, which would evoke limbic encephalitis. All right. So let's start with a case, and I, I'd like this to be fairly interactive, all right? So this is a 51-year-old male with a history of sarcoidosis of the lungs. Sarcoidosis is an autoimmune condition of the lungs. Thank you for the mood lighting, appreciate it. Uh, he's being <laughs> treated with Celsept, uh, uh, also known as mycophenolate and mofetil. That's an agent that suppresses the immune system and has kept his pulmonary sarcoidosis in remission. But he developed fever, upper respiratory symptoms, a headache, and shortly thereafter became a little bit, bit more lethargic, had some problems with language, and got a head CT at an outside hospital and was thought to maybe have an abnormality there. This is what his brain MRI looked like. And so, as you can appreciate, there's a pr pretty large area of abnormality here in the left temporal lobe. On other cuts, there were some abnormalities in the right as well. These are called hyperintensities on brain MRI. Um, and so he had a lumbar puncture, and the lumbar puncture showed increased protein in the spinal fluid. The glucose was normal, as were, were the white blood cell counts. And so I'd just like to kind of pull the audience here. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a, a, you know, a, a prolonged medical background, as Dr. Weir does. Um, I'd like you to offer your opinion. So does this patient have infectious encephalitis? Raise your hand. OK. Does this patient have autoimmune encephalitis? Raise your hand. OK. Is it neither? Raise your hand. OK. OK. So kind of a spread there. Uh, I think kind of 50-50 between infectious and autoimmune and uh, a few who said neither. So we'll get back to this patient in a moment. When we're thinking about encephalitis, we have to consider infectious and autoimmune causes, all right? Of the infectious causes, viruses really tend to predominate, and it turns out that herpes simplex virus is the most common cause of sporadic encephalitis in the US and really worldwide. And then there are epidemic causes of encephalitis as well, West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, enteroviruses, and so on. And really hundreds of viruses have been associated with encephalitis in addition to bacteria, parasites, fungal infections, mycobacterial infections. So really many, many infectious causes to consider in patients with suspected encephalitis. And then of course, a number of autoimmune causes as well. So there may be demyelinating syndromes. Uh, there may be systemic autoimmune disorders, such as sarcoidosis, which can then uh, develop inflammation in the brain, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, uh, and uh, really uh, a lot of interest nowadays, of course, in antibody-mediated uh, autoimmune encephalitides. And this is just kind of a timeline of discovery of a number of these antibodies. This, this actually uh, is, is not even up to date, but uh, it shows a number of antibodies that have been developed. And you can see the explosion over the last few years in terms of recognition of some of these autoantibodies associated with encephalitis. In addition to those, you've got to consider other uh, 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 etiologies as well. And I think this is really important for those of us who are seeing lots of patients with suspected encephalitis. We really need to make sure that the patient ha actually has encephalitis and not one of these other conditions that can mimic encephalitis. And so there are a number of kind of vascular conditions, stroke and so on, that many of these we can actually rule out relatively quickly based on neuroimaging, but there are a whole host of other conditions, metabolic derangements, toxins, uh, uh, primary epileptic conditions, and so on, for which we need additional blood testing, we need electrophysiological testing, sometimes we just need time in order to sort these things out. So back to this patient. So he had a, a really kind of broad infectious testing, uh, all of the viral PCRs were negative, uh, oligoclonal bands and IgG index were uh, unremarkable, he had an, uh, uh, an autoimmune uh, panel that was negative. Um, and so uh, he had been started on a medication for herpes simplex encephalitis, acyclovir, but that was stopped once the PCR, he, he had actually had two, two lumbar punctures, the PCR was negative in both. Um, and the presumption at this point was that this was some kind of an autoimmune encephalitis, probably related to his pulmonary sarcoidosis. So he was treated with steroids and he actually improved. So, presumed to have autoimmune encephalitis. He then, um, a few months later, came to see us in clinic. And at that point, he was complaining of some ringing in his ears, and uh, he had some hearing loss on exam, and so we sent him for audiometry. Surely enough, he had bilateral hearing loss. It was a little bit unusual that it had developed fairly recently in the absence of, you know, kind of any trauma. 
um, uh, or exposure to loud noises. And then he began to develop shortness of breath and he had to lay on several pillows at night uh, in order to be able to sleep. And we sent him to the cardiologist. He had a cardiomyopathy. His heart was not functioning properly. And so we really began to be suspicious then of this diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis and thought that this could very likely represent something else. And indeed, we then sent blood and spinal fluid lactate levels, and these were markedly elevated. And so these are markers of a mitochondrial encephalopathy. So this is a, a metabolic process that this patient had that, that is not going to respond to steroids. So what happened in this case is just the natural course of this disease process is that he developed this, my, this, this expression of his mitochondrial disease, that that got better, and it just so happened that that got better uh, when he was receiving the steroids. Right? So uh, I just wanted to uh, mention this case uh, first off because I, I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about autoimmune encephalitis, but I, I want you guys to remember that not every case that looks like autoimmune encephalitis is, and, and we have to be very careful about these cases. All right, let's talk about the epidemiology of encephalitis. So what's the incidence of encephalitis? Um, so as you can see here, here's the incidence. This is a slightly older slide. The incidence of MS may be a little bit higher than this, but not much. Here's spinal cord injuries here. In relation to traumatic brain injuries, these are quite low, right, and breast cancer. But if you look at encephalitis, the incidence actually rivals that of MS and spinal cord injuries. And when you think about the, the kind of research dollars that are that are placed on MS and spinal cord injuries, those really dwarf what has been allotted to encephalitis. And so uh, I think this is something that we all need to keep in mind as we move forward in our advocacy efforts. So next question. How does the incidence of autoimmune encephalitis compare to that of infectious encephalitis? All right. Autoimmune greater. Raise your hands. OK. They're equal, about equal. OK. Infectious greater, raise your hands. All right, okay, good. And we're not sure yet. That's generally a safe bet, isn't it? <laughs> all right, all right. So the epidemiology of encephalitis in the US, we looked at this in the, in the US population a few years back, and uh, there were about seven hospitalizations per 100,000 people. And this is very similar, actually, to other large studies that have been done in the US and worldwide. Uh, the incidence is highest in the very young and in the elderly. Um, when we looked at causes, about half of the individuals had a specific etiology found to their encephalitis. The other half didn't. Of those who had a specific etiology found, uh, the majority were viral. Uh, and the next biggest category was this other specified group, which is really autoimmune causes of encephalitis. And of course, there was a peak in kind of late summer and early fall, mainly due to viral encephalitis. This was a study out of England that came out uh, a few years back. And when they looked at the epidemiology, they did very careful studies. And in fact, they did uh, more broad-based autoantibody testing than has been done in many other large-scale studies. What they found is that herpes simplex virus was the most common cause of encephalitis, but that the next two most common causes were autoimmune, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and antibody-associated encephalitis. Uh, the other thing that is notable about the study is because of the extensive testing that they did, their, uh, the percent of unknown cases had dropped now to 37%. So historically, we haven't been able to figure out the cause of encephalitis in you know, 40, 50, even greater than 50% of cases. Now with more extensive testing, that number is starting to come down. But we're still left with a substantial proportion of cases for which we can't identify an etiology despite extensive testing. So HSV1, herpes simplex 1, most common cause of sporadic viral encephalitis. Here's the incidence. Uh, West Nile is the most common epidemic cause in North America, but Japanese encephalitis is the most common epidemic cause worldwide. I wanted to highlight this paper because it often gets misrepresented. Um, so, so this is a paper that came out of uh, Carol Glazer's group out of the, the California Encephalitis Project. And what they uh, noted is in individuals who are under the age of 30, that NMDA receptor cases surpass those of each of the other viral causes. And the way that this gets uh, kind of misquoted sometimes is that NMDA cases 
uh, are more common than, than the combination of all other viral cases. That's actually not true. So when you look at this, if you count up the number of viral cases, they exceed NMDA. But I think this was an important study that suggests that NMDA receptor encephalitis is quite common, particularly in those under the age of 30. This is a paper that came out in the last year uh, out of Rochester, Minnesota, uh, that used actually very strict case definitions of infectious and autoimmune encephalitis. And what they found uh, in kind of that local population is that the incidence of viral encephalitis was actually very similar to that of autoimmune encephalitis, all right? So those of you who said kind of equal, you may have been referring to this study, actually. Um, I would say that uh, at this point, we're, we're still not sure. And so I would, go, I would go with the we're not sure yet because uh, this is actually a relatively small study. We're still in need of, of much larger population-based studies in order to get at this question. I think the bottom line is that in my opinion, autoimmune encephalitis is at least as common as infectious encephalitis. And as we learn more about causes and as additional autoantibodies or cell-mediated disorders are found, that it is likely that the incidence of autoimmune encephalitis is going to exceed that of infectious encephalitis. All right, so what's the burden of encephalitis overall? Uh, so we know that in large studies, mortality is about 10%. This is a serious disease. And of those who survive, there are substantial sequelae in over 50% of individuals with encephalitis overall. The healthcare burden is quite high as well. So in the United States in 2010, the total charges were about $2 billion. And so this is just a huge public health burden that this disorder imposes. Um, this is data out of France that surveyed survivors for symptoms, and you can see a multitude of symptoms amongst the survivors, ranging from changes in concentration and behavior to intractable pain and very difficult to control depression. And I know there are a number of uh, encephalitis survivors here in, in the group today, and I, I imagine that you can relate to, to many of these symptoms. The other aspect about encephalitis is that we're not doing a great job of capturing the disability and the impacts of encephalitis on individuals. So this was uh, a study by Dr. Uh, Yeshu Kumar uh, when she was at Hopkins. She's now faculty at Mount Sinai. She's in the audience and she'll be talking later today. Uh, but when she looked at our patients with autoimmune encephalitis, what she noted was that there can be a discordance between kind of the traditional measures of disability that are used in large-scale neurological studies, the modified Rankin scale, which is really focused on physical disability, and on this really nice measure called, called an adaptive composite score, which, which is essentially a measure of how well one is performing under the environmental stressors of life. How well can one perform kind of daily, day-to-day -day, uh, uh, tasks with the stressors that are imposed. And what she noted is that that there are a lot of these individuals here who would not be classified as having a poor prognosis. An MRS of zero means you essentially have no disability, one or two, very little, who are actually really having difficulties performing uh, and adapting to kind of real life conditions. And so this is gonna be an intense area of study over the coming years. We looked at the in-hospital burden of autoimmune encephalitis amongst our cohort at Hopkins, and uh, we focused on uh, uh, 60 patients with autoimmune encephalitis. You can see kind of their characteristics here. Um, and we compared that burden to those individuals with herpes simplex encephalitis. And what we found is that the hospital charges were four times higher for patients with autoimmune encephalitis as compared to herpes simplex encephalitis. And HSE is no joke, right? This is a herpes simplex and stuff is a very serious disorder. Uh, the median uh, uh, length of stay for patients with AE was three times higher than for herpes simplex encephalitis. These charges were predominantly driven by intensive care unit needs. So patients with autoimmune encephalitis often develop very difficult to control seizures, difficult, difficult to control behavioral changes that end up resulting in markedly prolonged intensive care stays. And that really drives up the total length of stay and the charges. The other thing we looked at is 
what is what else is contributing that may potentially be reversible in these patients? What's contributing to their prolonged stays? And what we found were a few things, and this was interesting. So one is, in many cases, the immune treatment itself was actually quite prolonged. And, and so let me explain this. So for many patients with autoimmune encephalitis, we'll use uh, modalities such as plasma exchange, right? And plasma exchange is essentially like dialysis. You're kind of clearing out antibodies and, and some of the potentially uh, 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 damaging chemicals that are in the blood. And the way we typically do this is We'll, we'll do a plasma exchange, we'll wait a day, we'll do another exchange, we'll wait a day, and we typically do five to seven of these exchanges. And so you can imagine, once you've committed a patient to plasma exchange, they're in the hospital for at least 10 to 14 days. And that's if there are no complications associated with that treatment. Um, so I think we need to do better in terms of finding treatments that are more acute, that don't take as long, and that work. Uh, second, delay in diagnosis. And so this is a real challenge, and I think it points to the fact that we still really need to work on tools and methodologies that are going to allow us to detect autoimmune encephalitis sooner in patients. And then third, lack of early neurologic response. Now, some of this may be the natural history of the disease. Patients are, you know, can be pretty sick, as you guys know. Uh, and refractory seizures can be difficult to control. But I think this points to the fact that we, we need more efficacious and probably more personalized therapy for patients with autoimmune encephalitis. Okay, so let's turn now to, to some challenges in diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. So we'll start with a case, a 31-year-old uh, gentleman who one day prior to admission, um, his fiance noted that he was a little apathetic, he was confused, not able to recognize their four-year-old daughter. Uh, she didn't take him to the emergency room that day, uh, but the next day he developed a fever and there was no improvement in those symptoms and so she did take him to the ED. He had a history of diabetes and uh, at this point that was relatively well controlled but not uh, a few months prior and in that setting had developed a liver abscess uh, that was treated with uh, intravenous penicillin for three months. Uh, he had not been around anyone who'd been sick. He was not an IV drug user, no dental infections. On exam, he was febrile, and his heart rate was elevated. His blood pressure was a little bit low. And the most notable aspect of his exam was he was extremely slow in terms of his interactions and really unmotivated to interact. Um, and so you would ask him a question, and you have to wait 30 to 45 seconds before he would answer that question. And uh, you know, sometimes you'd ask a question he wouldn't answer. You'd ask another question, and as you're asking that second question, he would respond to the first question. He also had some urinary incontinence, so really prominent behavioral changes in this gentleman. This is what his head CT looked like. He has some hypodensities here in the frontal lobe, and you know, this goes back to, to um, some of what Dr. Weir was mentioning in, in terms of the interface between neurology and psychiatry. We're learning so much now about frontal lobe function and how alterations in the frontal lobe can predominantly present with psychiatric manifestations. So he had uh, some testing at the outside hospital, uh, all of which was kind of normal. Um, they did a lumbar puncture. He had elevated white blood cells. He had 10 white blood cells. That's not normal. Uh, his protein and glucose were normal. And so he was presumed to have multiple abscesses here in his brain as a result of that prior infection. And so he was started on antibiotics for that, but his mental status worsened. So he was transferred to our hospital. We, as soon as we saw him, we, we were concerned about infection as well, and we did a, 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 you know, an extensive evaluation for infection. We looked uh, at that prior uh, liver area. The abscess seemed to have resolved. We looked for evidence of infection of the, the cardiac valves that can do this. That was unremarkable as well. Uh, we repeated the spinal fluid. He still had inflammation, 10 to 15 white blood cells. This is what his MRI looked like. And this was really striking to us. And you can see multiple areas of abnormality here on the T2 flare sequences. Uh, you can also see on the post-gadolinium sequences multiple areas of enhancement. Um, at this point, we, we were actually pretty comfortable with the diagnosis. We thought we knew what was going on. Um, but th there was this lingering question of whether this, this still could be related to the prior infection that we had. And because 
he had an area here in the right frontal lobe that's actually very amenable to biopsy and that tends not to be eloquent, that you can sample that area and not leave patients with deficits. We did go ahead with the biopsy. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, this, is, this is not our criteria for brain biopsy at Johns Hopkins, by the way. Um, what we found was there, there's quite a lot of inflammation here uh, that if you look at a stain that's specific for myelin, the coating around axons that helps to speed conduction down the axon, this should be blue. This is called Luxol fast blue stain. There's very little blue here, right? There are a few remnants. So there's a lot of demyelination here. But the neurofilament staining that marks the axons and the neurons looked really good. It was preserved. So this was, this was demyelination with relatively preserved neurons and axons. And so that confirmed uh, the diagnosis of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. Uh, this is an inflammatory demyelinating disease. It's multifocal, um, and it's often post-infectious. And I think it, th this case really kind of highlights a couple of things. One, the intersection between infection and autoimmunity. Uh, and then two, it also highlights the intersection between neurology and psychiatry. Uh, I also wanted to bring this up because I, I am guessing that we're not gonna hear a lot about ADEM for the rest of the day, and so I thought it would be nice uh, to at least mention that here. All right, next case, 28-year-old uh, Indian male. Uh, he lives in California, uh, a wooded area. Um, no known animal exposures, no ill contacts. He hadn't traveled uh, recently, uh, but he developed a headache, uh, and it kind of worsened over a few weeks. Uh, he d described it as kind of severe bilateral pressure. He had some neck stiffness, some intermittent nausea and vomiting. And then he developed some confusion and saw his primary physician. He was thought to have a sinus infection, so he was treated with Augmentin. And here's where things get really interesting. He developed agitation and delusions that really centered on, on Game of Thrones. And um, actually, I never I have to admit, I've never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. I, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I've been told I should, um, but, um, but it, this was really striking. He just could not get this out of his mind, and he would imagine himself as kind of characters, and he would see other characters, and he would think that they were going to come meet him and that they would battle. Um, so uh, at, at the outside hospital, he had a head CT. It was unremarkable. He did have an elevated white count uh, in his blood. Uh, they were concerned about you know an encephalitis or a meningoencephalitis, and indeed, he had 57 white blood cells in his CSF when they did a lumbar puncture. Protein was a little elevated. And so they started him on antibiotics and antivirals for the presumption of a viral process, uh, mainly. Um, his blood and CSF cultures were negative. His viral PCRs were negative. And so all of this was stopped, and he actually started to improve. And by day three, he was getting close to back to normal, and so he was discharged. However, he was then readmitted to another hospital because he started developing episodic agitation and his blood pressure shot up to the 200 systolic, as you know, that's pretty high. His heart rate shot up to the 160s, again, very high. Uh, at that hospital, he had an EEG looking for seizures, a very reasonable thing to do, that was unremarkable. He had a brain MRI, that was normal. They repeated the spinal fluid, he still had inflammation. They repeated the infectious evaluation, still negative. They did a bunch of testing for autoimmunity, all of that was negative. Uh, they did some additional serum testing, and what they found is that one of his antithyroid antibodies was positive. It was around 400. Uh, and that was uh, higher than the upper limit of normal. He was treated with steroids and IVIG for the presumption that this was Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Uh, and his aggression and paranoia gradually improved, and a month later, he was, again, close to back to baseline and remained this way for about a year, and he was off all immune treatments, and at that point developed increasing headache again, agitation, paranoia, delusions, again, Game of Thrones. Um, repeat lumbar puncture, inflammation, right? 100 white blood cells now, a little bit worse than before, proteins higher. Repeat infectious workup was negative. This time, the NMDA receptor antibody was positive from the spinal fluid. So we'll get back to this case a little later, um, but I want to ask another question. So what is the most common brain MRI pattern seen in the acute phase of anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis? Is it increased T2 signal intensity in the basal ganglia? Is it subcortical white matter T2 hyperintensities? Is it a mixture of gray and white 
uh, matter hyperintensities? Is it that mesial temporal lobe, T2 hyperintensities, that we talked about Olympic encephalitis? Or is it normal brain MRI? So number one. Okay. Number two. It's either a shy group or you're pretty sure it's not any of those. All right. Mix of gray and white matter hyperintensities. Okay. <laughs> Bilateral mesial temporal lobe hyperintensities. All right. Normal brain MRI. Wow, excellent. All right. So you're absolutely right. This is a very well-educated group. Um, and, and so because of that, you know, we really do need better markers. So we talked, uh, Dr. Weir talked about MRI and, and how much it has really changed our perspectives, both in terms of neurology and psychiatry. But, but it has its limitations. It's really focused on structural measures. And there are some functional uh, MRI uh, sequences now that are done, but we're still learning about how well they may correlate with various aspects of disease. We looked at uh, FDG PET scanning, and Dr. Weir had briefly mentioned that. That's a, it's a metabolic test to look at glucose uptake. And interestingly, um, I won't go through this in the interest of time, but what we did find is that with NMDA receptor encephalitis, for example, uh, there, are, uh, there is a biomarker on FDG PET that appears to separate it from other autoantibody-mediated encephalitides. And so now we're kind of very actively looking at some of the other autoantibody-mediated encephalitis to see if we can kind of tease out more specific biomarkers for them. I think this really is a call for, um, for identifying uh, novel biomarkers. There may not be, in some cases, there may not be the, either the presence of an autoantibody or the ability to detect the immune derangement that's occurring by kind of the methods that we're typically using. And so we need better biomarkers for disease. All right. In the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about challenges in management of autoimmune encephalitis. So this is, this is really tough, and, and um, you know, we've thought a lot about how we approach patients with suspected uh, encephalitis, and you know, we've put together some flowcharts. And um, I think you know, clearly when a patient comes in with acute symptoms and they have a fever and you do the lumbar puncture and the HSV-PCR is positive, great. We know how to treat that patient. We know how to now, we know how to look out for complications of that. And I, I imagine that Dr. Dalma may talk a little bit about uh, some of those complications and some of the autoimmune encephalitides that can occur after herpes simplex encephalitis. Um, the real challenge is, and, and when we have confirmed autoimmune encephalitis, we have, you know, relatively uh, uh, straightforward initial pathways, at least, in terms of what, how we approach patients. And the challenge really is in determining how we uh, treat patients on an ongoing basis. The challenge is really when we have a patient with encephalitis, and despite the testing that we do, we're still left without a known cause. And we end up repeating the diagnostic evaluation. We have some newer tools now, next generation sequencing and so on, to try to make sure that there's not an active infection but what do we do when we do all of this stuff and the etiology is still unknown? Um, uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about that because I, I do think that several of our other, other speakers are going to hit on this. But, but if they don't, I, I think this will be an opportunity for, for questions whenever we get to a question and answer period. I'm not going to talk about uh, first and second line tr uh, treatments either because I think that's going to be covered. Uh, I will say that, that we do need additional treatments for these patients. So for example, many patients with autoimmune encephalitis, like I mentioned, develop refractory status epileptics. Their brain is just seizing away. And it often doesn't respond to kind of the first or second line treatments that we do. And so, for example, at our center, we're very interested in studying additional modalities that can help to break these seizures. And uh, along with Dr. Cervenko, who's really kind of spearheaded these efforts, we've uh, uh, employed the ketogenic diet actually quite successfully, even in uh, in the intensive care unit in critically ill patients. Uh, that we've used this to break uh, break seizures in these patients. This is really a, a therapy that's been inspired by history, and um, I think Dr. Weir, uh, I'm sure, is intimately aware of this given his knowledge of the history of neurology. But you know, we've recognized for for uh, centuries that the st state of starvation actually protects people from seizures. And the ketogenic diet actually mimics that kind of fasting or starving state. And, and it seems to be quite effective in, in a number of these patients. But again, I think this highlights that, that we need uh, additional therapies, not just immune therapies, but we need to be developing additional therapies to help our patients with AE. 
All right. So back to our case, uh, our, our Game of Thrones case. All right. So uh, he was treated with IV steroids and IVIG and then a slow oral steroid taper. And as he was tapering down on, on the steroids, his symptoms recurred. CSF again sampled, it was still inflammatory, and we tried to obtain rituximab for him, and it was denied by insurance. Denied by insurance. This is a patient with very well-documented NMDA receptor encephalitis, very well-documented relapses. This is the kind of patient where the bar should be fairly low, actually, to get a medication like rituximab approved, but it was denied. Now, when, when we got the denial, we said, well, that's, that's not unusual. You know, it's actually quite typical to get that initial denial and then to have to kind of fight a little further. And so, so I, you know, we put together some documentation, uh, sent that in, and it was denied again, right? So let me turn to one more case, 55-year-old male, in his usual state of health until a trip to Cuba. Uh, developed a fever, developed a rash, came, came back and started noticing some strange feelings, some strong smells, sensation of overwhelming fear. He was found down, uh, his, and he was brought to the emergency room. The MRI showed an abnormality in the left temporal lobe. Uh, it turns out that his PCR was positive for HSV, herpes simplex virus. He was treated with IV acyclovir. So, and, and he recovered well, but several months later, he began to develop repeated episodes of overwhelming chills, this feeling of really overwhelming anxiety. He would have goosebumps, confusion. EEGs during those episodes, we're pretty sure these were seizures, but during those episodes were unremarkable. And so he had a repeat spinal fluid study, this is now months after the initial episode, that showed 20 white blood cells. This is not normal, and elevated protein. Uh, we did a full kind of autoimmune workup on him, both from the blood and from the uh, spinal fluid. All of that was negative. But he did have unique oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid as compared to the serum. And what that suggests is that there's a local process whereby he is generating antibodies in the spinal fluid. Um, and so, you know, this, this is consistent with an autoimmune condition. We treated him with steroids. He got better. We started tapering the steroids. The episodes came back. So we started him on IVIG, and he had an excellent response. And this was for months. He had no episodes. And then there was a nationwide shortage in that particular formulation of IVIG. So he, we needed to switch formulations. And in switching, we were told that the IVIG was denied. And so we then had to fight. There was a delay. And as, as the delay ensued, he developed more and more of these episodes. But we eventually got him back, so we were able to switch formulations. Uh, the sh after the shortage was relieved, he was switched. Uh, the, the recommendation was to switch him back to the initial for formulation by the insurance company. Well, it turns out they recommended that, but said, now that you're switching again, we're going to deny it again. Oh. Right. So then there was another delay in getting him IVIG. And uh, he's back on it. Uh, he's doing reasonably well, but has, over the last couple of months, developed kind of some worsening of symptoms. His brain MRI actually shows a little bit more edema in that left temporal lobe than the prior brain MRI. We did another lumbar puncture. He uh, continues to have unique oligoclonal bands, so we decided that at this point we'd like to treat him with rituximab, and it was denied. All right. So I'm gonna leave you with some challenges in autoimmune encephalitis, um, I, and I've only listed a few here. There are many more, but I think we need to understand uh, the role of kind of additional biomarkers in evaluating patients with autoimmune encephalitis. We need to figure out what, what is the subset of patients that may benefit from brain biopsy uh, in order to establish a diagnosis. We really need to be able to understand in an organized way uh, both kind of initial treatment and maintenance treatment for patients with autoimmune encephalitis, both in terms of the choice of the agent and the duration of therapy and how to monitor these patients effectively. Uh, in particular, when we have a patient who we do all this evaluation, we know they have encephalitis, but we, we haven't identified the cause, when do we bite the bullet and use immunosuppression without being certain that the patient indeed has an autoimmune encephalitis? Um, how do we best characterize the deficits that follow encephalitis, not just the physical deficits, but the cognitive and social deficits that can occur? And given these limitations that I've just described with these last couple of cases in terms of treatment, how do we best advocate for our patients both as 
physicians, as patients, as family members, as organizations, uh, in order to help our patients and in order to uh, move the, the, the spectrum of the, the perspective of, of insurance companies in order to get the patients the treatments that we think that they need and that they deserve. The last challenge that I wanna mention is, what do you do when a patient comes to you with, um, pr with, the, pr with the presumption that they have autoimmune encephalitis and as physicians when we review their case and we really think that they don't have it, right? How do we then counsel these patients? How, how do we counsel patients and families? How do we get them from being invested in this diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis to then moving them towards a different diagnosis. And this is a very difficult conversation, very difficult conversation to have, but I think a very important conversation to have as well because these agents that we're using, they're not benign, right? They do expose patients to risk. So uh, this, is, this is something that you know, I think we grapple with every day. Just want to acknowledge some of the people who were involved in, in the work that I presented. Uh, John Probosco led the studies on FDG PET imaging and is continuing to do so uh, in our center. Romer Geocaden is our partner in the neurocritical care unit. Mackenzie Cervenka has really spearheaded the ketogenic diet studies. Here are some of the other folks who are involved in, in the studies that I talked about. And um, I think I'll, I'll close there. Uh, and I think, again, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next talk, but there should be opportunities for questions during breaks. So thank you. Thank you.